Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we continue in our study this week, as we look further at the verses that we will see in Daniel chapter 11, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and his guidance, so that as we open these words, we might more clearly understand all that we are to consider for this time in which we live. Shall we now seek him in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we have great need of you. We thank you for these opportunities we have to come before you that we may learn and that we may be able to consider carefully all that you would have us to see at this time. We ask for your blessing. We ask for your direction. We ask for your guidance. Help us so that we, our minds might be opened to more carefully consider all that you would have us to consider at this time. May your will be done. I pray for each one that are in this meeting. We are all facing challenges. Each one is being tested. We thank you for these tests. For as you have stated, you only discipline those that you love. Help us to show our love for you, Father. Direct us now in this study as we join together. And we pray for your blessing. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Now. Here we come to the next kind of stage with this with Daniel 11. Now, as we talked yesterday, it was interesting that Daniel 11.23, that the translators would place that verse. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. That they placed as occurring in 171 BC, roughly 20 years after Rome had defeated Greece at Thermopylae. Here in Daniel 11:24, we are told, he shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. Now, here again, we have margin readings that would bring this verse a little different, such as instead of entering and in, enter peaceably upon the fattest places, they would say he shall enter into the peaceable and fattest places of the promise. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. And yea, he shall think his thoughts against the strongholds, even for a time. Now, is there some of this that's more correct in the Hebrew? Or is is there a different way that we should look at this verse? Well, I, I have no idea what they're trying to do there, because it's not correct. The, the King James, so, yeah, so, I mean, it's, I mean, he shall enter, so that's that word bow, it's a really common word, he shall enter peaceably, now, so they're saying uh, into the peaceable and fat places. Right, correct. Which doesn't really make sense. They're entering peacefully into the, to the fat places of the provinces, or the fattest um, now, I'm not sure why, because uh, that's Mashman. Yeah, they could just say the fat places of the provinces rather than fattest. That's that's the only difference I would make. But to say, enter into the peace of, peaceable and fat places doesn't really make sense. Okay. And then the other one is dealing with, uh, think his thoughts, right? Right. Yeah. So we had looked at that. I mean, the words literally, uh, chashab, that means uh, to weave or fabricate, uh, to plot. So that's why they have forecast. And then the same with uh, makashibeth, right? So they, they don't look the same, but they do have some relationships in these words because they, they, they actually have the same root. So that's why I think his thoughts probably okay, but it doesn't give the same idea as forecasting his devices, right? 
So, because everybody thinks their own thoughts. So I, I would think forecast is devices is, is the best translation. Uh, and, and devices is, is also the idea here is a contrivance, something that has been like a machine, right? We could say machinations, right? If we wanted to, but it's, it's some invention or machine, a plot, curious work, contrivance. And it is from 2803. So 4284 is from 2803, the word forecast. I know. Does that help? Well, some. So now, as Smith would go through, his comment would be the usual manner in which these nations had, before the days of Rome, entered upon valuable provinces and rich territory was by war and conquest. Rome was now to do what had not been done by the fathers or the fathers' fathers, namely, receive these acquisitions through peaceable means. The custom before unheard of was now inaugurated of kings leaving by legacy their kingdoms to the Romans. They came into possession of a large portion of their tributaries in this manner. Now, okay, in the chat, a comment is made offering a collection of Adventist and non-Adventist theologians' comments on this particular verse. Now, Smith continues, and those who thus came under the dominion of Rome derived no small advantage therefrom. They were treated with kindness and leniency. It was like having the prey and spoil distributed among them. They were protected from their enemies and rested in peace and safety under the might of the Roman power. To the latter verse portion of this verse, Bishop Newton gives the idea of forecasting devices from strongholds instead of against them. This the Romans did from the strong fortress of their seven-hilled city, even for a time, doubtless a prophetic time, 360 years. From what, what point do they date? Probably from the event brought to view in the next verse. Would you agree? Okay, Suspe specifically with which? The date? What, what do you... Correct. Well, we have the Battle of Actium in here. So they, what's the date they give? Let's see. He's wanting to apparently place this subsequent to 161. Excuse me. All right, so here he is again, then addressing Actium. Yeah. So, so what we had done is, you know, Uriah Smith is going to say, well, there's a time, so that's 360 years. And we know it's the Hebrew number 6256. Six times two times five times six is 360. And um, then we, but we also connected this to, uh, so we have uh, Pompey's siege of Jerusalem in there. Then we got the Battle of Pharsalus, right? So. Uh, so we mark the time from the Battle of Pharsalus to the Edict of Milan, and then also from the Battle of Actium to uh, Constantinople being set up. On so we got we got dates, we got numbers of days. Um, we're saying that there's two different ways to interpret this, this verse, and both are correct as far as they shall forecast their devices against the strongholds even for a time. So there's two different time periods. Um, we have the Roman Jewish League in there as well, just connecting that idea that this is talking about all of the stuff leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem and then tying that up to the start of Rome. So the end of pagan Rome, basically. Those are all being addressed in these verses. And so when we go back where it says... Um, he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers, is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus in 70 AD. And when it says he shall scatter among them, among them is not in the Hebrew. It says he shall scatter the prey, the spoil, and the riches. And that's the dispersion of the Jewish people after the destruction of Jerusalem. And then yeah, he should forecast his devices against him from, as in upon or over, 
the strongholds, the city of Rome, even for a time. So these two different periods. So that's how we understood it. So he, so Uriah Smith is going to put the Battle of Actium in here, which is good, but he doesn't see the other connections. Okay. So as this verse would present, <clears throat> and he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but they shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. So Smith's comment, by verses 23 and 24, we were brought down this side of the league between the Jews and the Romans, B.C. 161, to the time when Rome had acquired universal dominion. <clears throat> the verses now before us bring to view a vigorous campaign against the king of the south, Egypt, and the occurrence of a notable battle between the great and the mighty armies. Did such events as these transpire in the history of Rome about this time? They did. The war was the war between Egypt and Rome, and the battle was the Battle of Actium. Let's take a brief glance at the circumstances that led to this conflict. Now, before we get further into Smith, I find it interesting. Smith's position using 161 being 30 years after Rome had defeated, had defeated Greece at Thermopylae. So we have this symbol of these 30 years, a time of preparation. Mm -hmm. Now, with the 158, <clears throat> we have 33 years. We don't know if it's 33 and a half, but we can say definitely it's 33 years. Now, Smith wishes to address the Battle of Actium. So, Mark Antony... Augustus Caesar and Lepidus constituted the triumvirate, which had sworn to avenge the death of Julius Caesar. So here we have the second triumvirate, because the first, of course, involved Julius Caesar, involved Pompey, and involved Crassius. This Antony became the brother-in-law of Augustus by marrying his sister Octavia. Antony was sent into Egypt on government business, but fell a victim to the arts and charms of Cleopatra, Egypt's dissolute queen. So strong was the passion he conceived for her that he finally espoused the Egyptian interests, rejecting his wife Octavia to please Cleopatra, bestowed province after province upon the latter to gratify her avarice, celebrated a triumph at Alexandria instead of Rome, and otherwise so affronted the Roman people that Augustus had no difficulty in leading them to engage heartily in a war against this enemy of their country. The war was ostensibly against Egypt and Cleopatra, but it was really against Antony, who now stood at the head of the Egyptian affairs. And the true cause of their controversy was, says Prido, that neither of them could be content with only half of the Roman Empire. For Lepidus, having been deposed from the triumvirate, it now lay between them, and each being determined to possess the whole, they cast the die of war for its possession. So basically, Antony and Augustus followed in much the same path that Julius and Pompey followed. Because if Lepidus was out, it followed that Crassius was also out during their triumvirate. Antony assembled his fleet at Samos, 500 ships of war of extraordinary size and structure, having several decks one above another with towers upon the head and stern, made an imposing and formidable array. These ships carried 200,000 foot and 12,000 horse. The kings of Libya, Cilicia, Cappadocia, Paphlagonia, Comangia, and Thrace were there in person. Those of Pontius, Judea, Lyconia, Galatia, and Media had sent their troops. A more splendid and gorgeous sight than this fleet of battleships as they spread their sails and moved out <clears throat> up and the bosom of the sea, 
the world has rarely seen. Surprising all in magnificence came the galley of Cleopatra, floating like a palace of gold beneath a cloud of purple sails, its flags and steamers fluttered in the wind, and trumpets and other instruments of war made the heavens resound with notes of joy and triumph. Antony followed close after in a galley of almost equal magnificence, and the giddy queen intoxicated with the sight of the warlike array, short-sighted and vainglorious, at the head of her infamous troop of eunuchs, foolishly threatened the Roman capital with approaching Rome. Okay, so from the chat. So that's just the web page that uh, Kelly's just gave a clip from that. So there is, so what he's referring to, what Kelly's referring to here is just there is this uh, website that puts a uh, different presentations together of that interpretations of Daniel 11. Okay. And that one is from, come on, I can't see this. Okay, there we go. It was, it was put together by the uh, South Korean Seventh-day Adventist Conference or something like okay. this. Uh, yeah. A guy that's a member of the South Korean. It's translated from Korean to English, so it may not be totally right in the English. Yeah. But yeah, so but that that one that you do the picture of, the clip of, mm -hmm. that's the South Korean mm -hmm. Union Conference publication. So, it, yeah, so these uh, are just basically different commentaries on Daniel eleven, just really short what they what they, how they interpret it. And the and the photo that I sent in the chat is Uriah Smith. Well, that's Smith's one. Yeah, no, I don't. Think, you sure? Yeah, uh, Smith on Daniel eleven twenty-five to thirty. He he includes comments from Smith on all of Daniel eleven except for maybe a verse or two, very short comment. But it it, okay. it mentions the one sixty-one or whatever whatever that yeah. year was. Yeah, yeah, that's... League of the Jews and so on. Just wonder if the dates there are any different than what we've been talking about. Or events. Well, no, what we no the well, no, the dates aren't any different. I mean, Uriah Smith just uses when they first go. Can you explain that, Stephen? Can you explain the one sixty one, one fifty eight for Kelly? So the charts yeah. say one fifty eight for the league, yes. and Smith is one sixty one. Yeah. So my understanding is the league was originally in one sixty one. And um, on uh, 150, it was when uh, Greece actually left off in fighting the Jews. And the references on the 1843 chart are correct as they apply to 158. Um, but my understanding is that there doesn't seem to be any justification that Rome had any part in Greece uh, leaving off uh, from fighting the Jews because of the league. I'm not too sure of that, but I think it's something which Miller uh, associates with it. But I'm not finding any evidence, unless he came across things there which I haven't found. But yeah. I don't I don't see any evidence for that. It might have some, been something he supposed, that because of this year league, then a few years later, that the Jews are then left alone by the Greeks. Um, but as I say, I can't put any substantial yeah. So there is evidence to back it up. Right. So there's no there's no direct that Rome intervenes in 158 that that we know. Not that I say. Right. No, no. When you when you when you read Maggot's piece and the references that uh, Mother points to, there's nothing really about Rome. It's it's more right. to do with the Maccabeans' prowess in defeating the Greeks. That seems that the Greeks just kind of uh, are confounded them and just decide to leave off from fighting them. But I don't mm -hmm. see any evidence that the League has anything to do with that. Right. So there's no direct thing that said that Rome's involved. But we still connect it to the Roman League in 161, that there that there must be some connection. It might have had some influence. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, so the Greeks would have been aware of that league. They would have been aware that Rome had, well, Rome had been previously been defeating Macedonia and parts of Greece. So yes. they were, were well aware of their threat. And maybe that was like an added emphasis to sort of leave the Jews alone, possibly. Yeah. Now, now we do have from the original league with the Gibeonites uh, to 161 BC is 1,332 years, which is 666 times 2. And then you have the three years to 158. So we accept the 158, but not in the way that people often understand it. Is that how you would say it? Because it has to be. It has to be a result of it, right? The 158 must be connected to the 161 in some way, because that's 1335 years from the league with the Gibeonites. And then you have 666 years to 508, and then 1335 to 1843. Certainly there is a, a structure yeah. to include 158 that seems to lend some credence to it being uh, of significance. Yeah. But we just wouldn't say, we wouldn't just say it's the Roman Jewish League in 158 in just a direct way like that. We would say that there is that three-year period that connects it. And certainly there's symbolism in it, I think, with uh, To the Midnight Cry. And if you can connect it to the 15th of August, 158, and then uh, on the chart, then the the next date or the next thing is the cross. If we parallel yeah. with the Sunday law, mm-hmm. and so you have that uh, that there, the Sunday law or the cross paralleling October twenty second, eighteen twenty four. So you have mm-hmm. that one five eight, uh, the cross, and then uh, after that you have four ninety, which would be a symbolism of closure probation. Mm-hmm. So to me, I, I would sort of see sort of like a some. Waymarks being identified there with the 158, the cross, and the 490. Yeah, and even the, one, even the 161 is the wave sheaf offering. Yes, yeah, so you could put that symbol in there as well, yes. Yeah. Now, now as far as the date for the Battle of Actium, we have um, September 2nd in uh, 31 BC, and that that date is the same that, that Levi Smith has. And, and we uh, think that even for a time then goes to 330 A.D. The sort of midpoint between the 164 date with the death of Antiochus Epiphanes, and then it's 158. The sort of midpoint is that 161 between them two dates as well. Okay. So you can you can maybe say 161 there is, is maybe there and kind of like in the same way we identify the tenth day. Of the seventh month and 457. Okay. The midpoint. Yeah. Okay. Then, then we're just going to add the, the Battle of Pharsalus in there to the Edict of Milan. So we have, have here, um, just for Kelly's sake and other people watching this, I'm going to put up the, where is it here? The diagram. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop your share there, Dwight. We do that. They changed how they did this. So if you look at this chart here, Kelly, can you see that? Or is it too tiny? No, that's good. I can double tap it and enlarge it as well. Okay. So what you see here is this this chart. We have the the Roman Jewish League there, time on the left, time the end of the Greek dominion over the Jewish nation. Now so that's going to be the Roman Jewish League. That's going to happen in 161. And then, so that's why the 158 has to do with the time of the end of the Greek dominion over the Jewish nation. Then there's 95 years to Pompey's siege of Jerusalem, then 15 years to the Battle of Pharsalus. The Battle of Pharsalus on August 9th, 48 BC, is going to be 360 years before the Edict of Milan. That's when they Wait. get the freedom of religion. Wait. Uh, so, so the one sixty one to one fifty eight. What's that three year period about? 
That's from Again? the Roman Jewish League to the time of the end of the Greek dominion over the Jewish nation. So the Greeks still have some influence there, but so they're no longer under the Greeks in 158. They're independent. For three, for those three years, the Greeks, it took the Greeks another three years to stop bothering the, the Jews? Or well, the thing is, there was a, power over the Jews? Yes, we'll, we'll just say it that way. That's fine. So, so they're no longer under Jewish dominion or Greek dominion. The Jews are no longer under Greek dominion. Now, Judea. Who, who is in is power? The, hmm? Who is in power in Greece at that time? Who was in power in Greece at that time? I don't know. Tychus Epiphanes was there uh, earlier, so I'm not sure. Me, it probably Tychus the fifth or the sixth. It doesn't really I matter. Wonder. I just wonder if he that power or person is mentioned in Daniel eleven. No. No. Okay. And then um, now. Judea receives complete independence in uh, 129 BC. That's where most scholars would not. Um, so that means now, now to some degree, the Jews, in order to make a league with the Romans, have some independence, right? So it, you know it happens pretty gradually. But the idea that Miller had that that the Jews were always controlled by some other nation isn't true. Um, because there's a period from, let's say, from the Roman Jewish League to 63 BC that Jerusalem is independent, right? They're not controlled by the Greeks. They have a league with the Romans, but they're not controlled by the Romans until Rome comes in 63 BC under Pompey. And uh, that's when they become controlled by Rome. So Miller has a bit more simplistic the, view of it. what's that? So, the, so is it ninety-five years where they had no power over them? Yeah, is that what you said? Yeah, they're, yeah. they're independent for ninety-five years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what land were they in when they were independent? Well, they're in Jerusalem. Okay. They just—I mean—they've been in Jerusalem the whole time, but they were controlled. You know, they were freed from cap Babylonian captivity by the Persians, right? And then they were given, you know, Jerusalem was given back to them. You know, they they had their temple rebuilt. They had their administrative structure. Um, when Greece comes in, right, they're going to be controlled or dominated by Greece. Um, but they become independent in that, you know, 158 BC at that time. You know, I mean, it happens more gradually than that. There's other things going on. But basically, yeah, there's almost 100 years that they're not controlled by anybody. But then Rome mm -hmm. is coming in 63 BC, and now they're going to be under the control of Rome. So that's when the Roman occupation begins. So well, that's that's uh, that's significant for me. I never realized that. You know, that I I had the idea that the Jews were always under under another power, never an independent nation. So they were for 95 years. Yep. Okay. And in some degrees, they were even independent before that, uh, you know, bits and pieces here. Yeah. So it would have been Antiochus V uh, from 164 to 161. So in 158, it would have been Antiochus VI in 158. Uh, no, it was uh, Demetrius, I think. Dem Demetrius I, Soter. Oh, okay. And yeah, so they changed from, names there. Okay. Yeah, so he was from one... Um, 61. Uh, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe late one. Anyway, for about 12 years afterwards. Okay. So 161 to 149. Something like that. Okay, so Demetrius is the, the one who's... Yeah. Okay. Okay. But that's so that's kind of the idea. And then we have like this these two periods of 360 years, one from the Battle of Pharsalus in 48 to the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. And then the Battle of Actium is the one that Uriah Smith uses to the establishment of Constantinople in 330 on May 11th, 330 AD. So 
So he takes that September 2nd, 31 BC to May 11th, 330 as even for a time. But we have two different periods because one is from their fortresses and one is against their fortresses. So we take two different interpretations of the text. And then, um, and then we note that there is between the Battle of Actium and the Edict of Milan, between the two, those two, is 343 years, or actually 125,200 days, which equals 13 times 400. Um, and then 330 years, 343 years is, of course, seven times seven times seven. So, so we had we had worked through this before in detail in earlier studies. Anyway, Dwight, you can bring yours up again. Okay. So, Caesar Augustus, on the other hand, displayed less pomp and more utility. He had but half as many ships as Antony, and only eighty thousand foot. But all his troops were chosen men, and on board his fleet were none but experienced seamen. Whereas Antony, not finding mariners sufficient, had been obliged to man his vessels with artisans of every class, men inexperienced and more calculated to cause trouble than to do real service in the time of battle. The season being far consumed, in these preparations, Caesar made his rendezvous at Bronsnium and Antony at Corsira till the following year. As soon as the season permitted, both armies were put in motion by sea and by land. The fleets at length entered into the Ambracian Gulf and Epirus. Epirus. Epirus? Epirus, yeah. Why couldn't they use a Y there? Yeah, who knows? But anyway, that's how it's normally said on the videos that I watch. Okay. <laughs> and the land forces were drawn up to either shore in plain view. Antony's most experienced generals advised him not to hazard a battle by sea with his inexperienced mariners, but to send Cleopatra back to Egypt and hasten at once into Thrace or Macedonia and thrust the issue to his trust the issue to his land forces, who were composed of veteran troops. But he illustrating the old adage, whom God wishes to destroy. He first strikes man, infatuated by Cleopatra, seemed only desirous of pleasing her, and she, trusting to appearances only, deemed her fleet invincible and advised immediate action. Yeah, so so um, this is so poorly written, but <laughs> so what yeah. ends up happening is they're going to have this battle of, of Actium. And it's, I mean, this is true, where he, she's going to have this larger fleet. Uh, uh, but Augustus, he's going to have, I can't remember the, the guy's name who's actually in charge of the fleet. Um, he really allows him to, to deal with the sea battle. Now, they, they, uh, you know, they don't want to. Caesar doesn't want to go into the sea battle initially, but he's going to be, let me see, how does that work? I'm trying to remember the details of that. Um, anyway, do, do you remember the name of the guy who's in charge of the fleet, the admiral or whatever you would call him? No. Okay, I can't think of his name. Yeah, well, Marcus Agrippa's Anthony's, but it's more Caesar's, because because he's the one who wins the sea battle for him. Yeah, so th this is kind of confusing how it's written, because it, I've watched videos on it. It's a lot clearer in the videos than what he's describing. Hey, go on. Okay. People people could watch a video. You, there's good videos on YouTube if you want to see how the Battle of Actium actually occurred. The battle was fought September 2nd, B.C. 31, at the mouth of the Gulf of Ambra Ambracia, near the city of Actium. The stake was the world for which these stern warriors, Antony and Caesar, now played. The contest, long doubtful, was at length decided by the course which Cleopatra pursued. For she, frightened at the din of battle, took to flight when there was no danger, and drew after her the whole Egyptian fleet. 
Antony beholding this movement and lost everything but his blind passion for her, precipitately followed and yielded the victory to Caesar, which had his Egyptian forces proved true to him. And had he proved true to his own manhood, he might have gained. The battle doubtless marks the commencement of the time mentioned in verse 24. And as during the time devices were to be forecast from the stronghold or Rome, we should conclude that at the end of that period, Western supremacy would cease or such a change take place in the empire that the city would no longer be considered the seat of government. From B.C. 31, in a prophetic time, or 360 years, would bring us to A.D. 330. What took place that year? The seat of empire was m- removed from Rome to Constantinople by Constantine the Great. See Encyclopedia Americana, article, Constantinople. So, it's interesting the way that that Smith chose to approach this portion and the way in which she was written. Pasted the wrong thing. No, oh, why is it doing that? It's not copying this. I keep trying to post something, but it, oh, there we go. Okay, so that's that's a link to the a video on the Battle of Actium if you want to understand it better. Okay. So if anybody downloads that link there, you can. That's the video I watched. So it, it gives quite a bit different account than what uh, Uriah Smith gives. Like quite a different impression, I guess, is maybe the way to look at it. He provides some details that are uh, different. Okay. So anyway, the now, 360 years, we accept that. So we would now come to this portion. So Smith's next article published on the first day of the 12th month of 5915. So of this, there were a few days in between when Smith published verse, the, the, his thoughts on verses 24 and 25 and then came into the next portion here. Now, the thing that I did note is that when they did the typecast or the typeset on this, instead of saying verse 26 in the original article, they have it 27 and then following with 27. So Smith presents verse 26. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army, his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. The cause of Antony's overflow was the desertion of his allies and friends, those that fed on the portion of his meat. First Cleopatra, as already described, suddenly withdrew from the battle, taking 60 ships of the line with her. Secondly, the land army, disgusted with the infatuation of Antony, went over to Camus, who received them with open arms. Thirdly, when Antony arrived in Libya, he found that the forces which he had left there under Scopus to guard the frontier had declared for Caesar. Fourthly, being followed by Caesar into Egypt, he was betrayed by Cleopatra and his forces surrendered to Caesar. Hereupon, in rage and despair, he took his own life. Now, verse 27. Okay, just going back there. So so in verse 26, the way that we understood this was um, uh, we, we discussed like they that feed the portion of his meat. So exactly what this was referring to. We, we were sort of not sure. Just trying to find it here. So we had uh, that Rome that has to do with Egypt's because Egypt is providing this grain. So Rome was dependent upon Egypt for grain. So he doesn't really address that exactly. Right. He's just saying saying Anthony's overthrow was the desertion of his allies and friends, those that fed of a portion of his meat. But So I guess he's addressing it, but not in the way that, that we would. So he's just making it much more just his friends, his allies and friends. I'm not I'm not sure 
the desertion. So they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. I guess that would be the allies uh, that joined with uh, uh, Augustus. Right. Is that what he's saying? And so we're just saying um, that Rome itself was dependent upon. So it's not just his allies. It's it's Rome as well. I don't know. Because we had a, quite a discussion about that. Now, we do know Anthony commits suicide August 1st, 30 B.C. Anthony commits suicide when? August 1st, 30 B.C. Okay. And then we have this overflowing, right, which we know will symbolize the, the Sunday law, right? So Rome then is going to take over this area. So so I guess Rome at this time now has the entire uh, territory, right, the northern and the southern. That's the way it would look. Yeah. Okay. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Here Smith's comment is, Antony and Caesar were formerly in alliance, yet under the garb of friendship, they were both aspiring and intriguing for universal dominion. Their protestations of difference to and friendship for each other were the utterance, utterances of hypocrites. They spoke lies at one table. Octavia, the wife of Antony and sister of Caesar, declared to the people of Rome at the time Antony divorced her that she had consented to marry him solely with the hope that it would, ho that it would prove a pledge of union be between Caesar and Antony. But the council did not prosper. The rupture came, and in the conflict that ensued, Caesar came off entirely victorious. Yeah. So, so we we are, we basically are in agreement with what he says here. So this is reflecting back on earlier. So after it describes the death of Anthony, right? Then it's going to go back saying that the, both of these kings, right? They were desiring aspiring and intriguing for universal dominion right right they both want to control the roman world and so it's just saying that this was a, a false alliance they spoke lies at one table um and that it didn't end up prospering so now we have we have you know present truth applications of that um we're saying that that, that this is a long alliance between the usa and the united nations they formed these false alliances at 9-11 uh, but the agreements wouldn't last as per actium, which is what we're going to see that we line that up with 2030, the end of the 2030 agenda. That's how we, we interpreted that. Now, it's also interesting because didn't Elder Jeff make an application of this in the situation between himself and Carmander? Yeah, he did. But that's not really good if you're <laughs> you're going to compare this with you and Parminder is the king of the north and the king of the south, except that we would say that Jeff is the king of the north, Parminder is the king of the south in that context. So, so there is an application that you could put in that direction, but then they both, uh, you know, it's, it's about, it's about seeking control of Rome. So I don't know how you would apply that, but, but we haven't made any direct application in that way in our understanding of these verses. That would have to be a different line. Okay. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. To returning... We should, to we should, go, we should go, back, go back there to uh, verse 27. All right. Uh, go back. Uh, go back a bit. Right. Uh, that part for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Right. Uh, we didn't really address. We just just to go through that. So we understand uh, that word yet is the word an iteration. It's the same word that says within 65 years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people that word within. Yet it, it means an iteration. So what it's saying is that at the end. So yet. 
uh, the end is going to be a repetition of dealing with something that happens at the beginning. So, so this end we're going to mark as February 15th, 1798 shall be the time appointed. That's going to refer to October 22nd, 1844. So this was the reference to uh, that period of time that was talked about earlier, that 45 years or whatever you want to put it in there, 46 years. So, so that's something that's been missed out for the yet the end shall be at the time appointed. The end being the Cates, time appointed being Moad, right? Which is referring to uh, the Day of Atonement. That's the feast. <clears throat> Moed. So, so it's something that Uriah Smith just misses out on, right? Because he just looks at time appointed as well. That's going to be the end of the 360. But this is actually talking about an iteration of repetition that happens that the end and the beginning are tied together. And that end is not, you know, 330. It's that 1798. Does that make sense? That, that this all becomes typical of what happens at the time of the end in Millerite history, that we can tie these lines together. So there's a purpose in this to address the main point of this whole study is understanding the two 2520s, right? Because that's, that's the purpose of Daniel chapter 11 or Daniel's last vision from 10 to 12 is so that Daniel can understand the Kazone. Is, is everybody following that? Oh, Dwight disappeared. So do people follow what, what I'm saying there? That this, um, this, this verse, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed, is referring to that period from 1798 to 1844. Because that's what Daniel is, doesn't understand. He doesn't understand the end of the 2520s. And, and that's what he's been giving that understanding. So the whole reason that he's given all of this structure is so that he can understand the end, not so much that he can understand the middle, like all of these events, because he need he needs to understand the, the Kazone. Uh, how to remind me uh, speak lies at one table with that, what that's talking about. Well, that's, that's, that's the part of the triumvirate. That's where uh, Octavius and uh, Ptolemy, you know, they, they joined together with Lepidus, right? And, and the main thing there was to avenge the death of Julius Caesar. But they, they make a pretense of working together, but both of them have their own personal agenda. So that's, that's the king of the north and the king of the south, if we want to put it that way. Because... Um, okay. Because uh, uh, Anthony's connected with Cleopatra, which is Egypt, which is the south. And um, obviously Rome is the king of the north. And, and so there's an alliance that happens at 9-11 is how we look at it in our application. But that alliance will end. And what are the lies at 9-11? Right? Yeah, so... so, the, so so the king of the south I mean, still exists in, in a sense, but at some point it comes to an end. With the Sunday law, they all become united uh, with the papacy, right? We have the threefold union. So their, their personal ambitions all become lost in this one united effort against God's people. I mean, in a sense, you their, could say, you could say interest, that what's that? Their interests become aligned. Yeah. So, so in some say. ways you can say that these uh, triumvirates are typical of the threefold union of the dragon beast and the false prophet. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Yeah. Okay. But this is both these kings. So there's two in this case. That's king of the south, king of the north, king of the south, Rome yeah. and Egypt. Okay. Right. Which, which we take in, in our application in the United States and the UN at 9 11. That's where they form their false alliance. It's not between, not between the US and the papacy. 
No, because that's, that's a different because the papacy is not the king of the north. Well, they're, they're the king of the north in a sense, right? At certain times, but the United States, when the armies of the United States become the armies of Rome, with 1989, mm -hmm. that's the alliance between the United States and the papacy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And then we have 9/11s, the alliance between the United States and the UN. Right. So there was reaching their hand across um, the Gulf okay. to join hands with the papal power and then reaching across the abyss to join hands with spiritualism. So, so okay. those happen in preparation for the Sunday law. So in, when the Sunday law occurs, it's going to be the papacy that's ultimately in charge. Right. In that that threefold mm -hmm. union. So so all of these are in preparation to that threefold union when the papacy uh, I mean, it's going to be through the United States that the Sunday law occurs, but the papacy is the one really that's a behind it all. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So does that kind of help? Can, can Ra you rallying, that? rallying, grassroots movement rallied by the papacy through the uh, uh, false prophet of the apostate Protestant churches. Mm-hmm. And then we also have the UN involved there, too, because, you know, a Sunday law can't come about as a result of just, you know, Protestants or just Catholics, because you need the whole world. And Rome is divided into three parts, right? Babylon is divided into three parts, the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. So the dragon power has to be drawn into this as well. And that's where we see the part of like the UN, the World Economic Forum, uh, and all these different uh, forces working to to their own ends, right? That is, they have their own goals in mind. They have these these alliances, but in a sense, they're false alliances because each one is seeking its own power. But the one that's going to end up ultimately in power is going to be the papacy, right? That is, these... Yeah. These powers are going to set the papacy upon the throne of the earth once again. Right. That's right. the idea. Yeah. The United States will lead with the Sunday law. The world will follow through the United Nations promotion. Yeah. Because everyone has their own interests in mind. Right. Yeah. You know, they're not. So their thinking... interests are all represented. Their, their interests are all represented at the United Nations, I guess. Well, it's just that their their what they what they think are their interests. It, it's all um, you know sort of utilitarian in that sense, um, because you know obviously uh, atheistic humanism isn't really interested in in following the Pope, right? Yeah, yeah. Protest Protestant America isn't interested in following the Pope, but but all of these groups think that their interests can be made through these alliances. Uh, but in the end, it, so, it helps the papacy. So, it, but it shall not prosper. So what doesn't prosper then? The Sunday law comes into being no. what does not prosper. No, what doesn't prosper is the alliance between the United States and the UN. That is, in what uh, the UN was seeking. Because the UN was seeking to ultimately be in control of the United States. We see that now, right? We see that mm -hmm. the United States was conquered by the UN on January 6th, 2021, right? By the globalists. So the globalists have their ambitions. That's the World Economic Forum. All these people have this idea. They have the 2030 agenda. Um, but they're not the power that is going to be uh, ultimately in control. They're going to lose this battle so to speak right so the battle of actium okay. and what happens with mark anthony and egypt shows that the un is not going to stand it's not going to be the one that fulfills its purpose right it's it's all going to be about the papacy in the end that is that is what has gotten my attention in this book because he explains that very well um, that it will not be the United Nations that brings it well you know it's like I know they're involved 
but it's almost like a distraction from where the Sunday law will really come from. Oh, okay. I just. Uh, yeah. 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 So I, I think I understand what you're saying about this book, about the new world order. So, so when people are worried about the world economic forum, we did an in-depth study on them. And, and basically um, the world economic forum is not a threat. That is, they're a bunch of juvenile, uh, you know, their ideas are juvenile. They can't accomplish anything. They're, they're basically idiots, right? So they're, the they're people, big ideas. The main name they, associated with that is Klaus Schwab. Yeah, Klaus Schwab. The yeah. Main, and so he's having quite a bit of success with Trudeau in, our, in Canada. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So, yeah, so exactly. So what, what they end up doing, the role that they play is more destructive than anything. Because they, ha they have these beliefs that they're going to bring about, you know, this wonderful utopia, right? But uh, and, and the, 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 the unite the world, right, under one government. Um, but that's not going to happen. That doesn't happen, right? Their goals don't succeed. And that's just because they're idiots. They they have no practical. Uh, they their ideas are juvenile, right? They're the types of things you think about when you're 15. Mm -hmm. So we're so because I've always been, I don't know, I've had this reservation on this idea of a one world government. I just is that something that you guys discussed i'm sure it is and where'd you come down on that one world government well there isn't going to be a one world government no but they they are seeking to have a one world government but is they that don't part of the them. new world order idea one world government okay. yeah, so the idea of of atheistic humanism is they want to have a one world government that's the globalists right that's the UN. Mm -hmm. So that's real. Now, they're not going to have a one world government, if that's what you're asking. Right. Right. Yeah. You're, you're still going to have all these different countries of the world. The UN is not going to achieve its goal. Right. Its goal is to have one government, one law uh, controlling everybody. But but it's so impractical and so impossible. Um. That yeah. their goals are going to be set aside in the Sunday law because the Sunday law is not going to be a one world government that causes the Sunday law. Right. Right. It's, it's going to be a threefold right. union of these three different powers the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Mm -hmm. So, but, but they don't join the idea that the UN the has government. these goals. What's that? In a sense, do they, don't they join together to form a one world government? No, not a one world government. It's a threefold union. I'm asking questions that people will ask me now, because I don't see it in Bible prophecy. I see the United States, and I see the papacy, and I see spiritual and, and the dragon power. These are three different powers. Not one, not not one. Right? There's three, threefold union. Yeah, which which we have always understood. We we've, we've never. I mean, in my understanding. I've never ever thought that we're going to have a one world government, but we do have a power that wants a one world government. So that is okay. the new world order, right? So that, I can, I mean, that's I can, another word for, for, you know, the dragon power, the UN, um, mm -hmm. you know, atheistic humanism, the world economic forum. That's their goal, right? They want a one world government. The United States so what, is it, it isn't looking for a one world government. That's never been the role of the United States, right? No. And and the papacy is the looking to control the, the religious world, right? It wants you know everybody to be Catholic. Mm -hmm. So these these powers have been uh, fighting together or fighting against each other, seeking for world dominion. Mm -hmm. Uh, for a long time, right? So each one of these wants their agenda to be the agenda that controls everything. But it's going to be the papal agenda ultimately that wins over. Mm. Uh, someone brought to my attention, and I, here I'll give you a, 
I'd like to hear what you got to say that uh, in previous studies with the Canadian group that you had protested, someone was going on about the New World Order, and they quote you saying, there is no New World Order, and you were getting quite excited about it. And, uh, I, I don't think I ever said there was no New World Order. Okay. Um, yeah, this is probably the discussion dealing with, with their idea that... Um, that the world economic forum is the power that's going to be in control. So I, I, I would never have said there's no new world. Um, okay. But because that's definitely a part of, of what has happened in the connection between uh, both the United States joining with uh, the papal power and also the United States joining with uh Spiritualism. So if you're going to talk about the new world order in that context, that's just the threefold union. But what they're talking about is the idea that who we have to worry about is the world economic forum. We're going to be controlled by the world economic forum because the world economic forum has a plan, right? You know, that in 2030, we're not going to own anything and we'll be happy about it. You know, we're going to have electric cars pick us up to take us wherever we want. They'll just be automated cars. Nobody will own a vehicle. Um, you know, all these different ideas, right? We'll live in 15 Greta, minutes, Greta, 15 minutes from Greta, every place we have to go. What? What's her name? Greta Thunberg? What's her name? Greta? How do you say her last name? You know, the one, the young lady. Yeah, I don't know how to say her last name. Greta Thunberg. But anyway, Greta. Yeah, well, she says that all guitars, apparently she's saying now that all guitars have to be electric by 2030. That's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> yeah but um okay well thank you a lot for that that helped a lot yeah but yeah i mean if if you hear something about me through the rumor mill it, it's probably mm -hmm. not true because well, people... i'm sure it's embellished and i try to explain to people remember in school when we sat in a circle and there was 10 people and by the time it got to the 10th person person it was totally different remember that okay <laughs> Yeah, it's a pretty simple thing. Problem. Yeah. Yeah. Go and ask the horse. If he's got any teeth, he'll talk. Okay. Give him an apple, maybe. All right. Sorry about that, Dwight. That was quite a rabbit trail, but I, <laughs> that really helped a lot. Thanks, Theodore. Yeah. Okay, Dwight. So you haven't come up with a gas-powered um, guitar yet? <laughs> gas -powered. No, <laughs> but but, you I, know... I have a One day they may oh, not make guitars oh, out of wood oh, anymore. They'll all be uh, uh, carbon fiber. Interesting. <laughs> With solar okay. power panels on them, too. <laughs> okay. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. Two returnings from foreign conquests are here brought to view. The first after the events narrated in verses 26 and 27, and the second after this power had had indignation against the Holy Covenant and performed exploits. The first was fulfilled in the return of Caesar after his expedition against Egypt and Antony. He returned to Rome with abundant honor and riches, for, says Pridu, at this time such vast riches were brought to Rome from Egypt on the reducing of that country and the return of Octavianus, Caesar, and his army from thence. And the value of money fell one half, and the price of provisions and all vendable wares were doubled thereon. Caesar celebrated his victories in a three days triumph, a, a triumph which Cleopatra herself would have graced as one of the royal captives, had she not artfully caused herself to be bitten by an asp. The next great enterprise of the Romans after the overflow of Egypt was the expedition against Judea and the capture and destruction of Jerusalem. The Holy Covenant is doubtless the covenant which God had maintained with his people, beginning with Abraham, and renewing it since Christ with all believers in him. The Jews rejected Christ, and according to the prophecy that all who would not hear that prophet should be cut off, 
they were destroyed out of their own land and scattered to every nation under heaven. And while Jews and Christians alike suffered under the oppressive hand of the Romans, we think it was in the reduction of Judea especially that the exploits mentioned in the text were exhibited. So is Smith here trying to say that the overthrow of Egypt should be compared with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD? No, he's just saying that after the, the, the overthrow of Egypt, then he's describing what he calls the exploits, right? Now, the exploits, of course, is an added word, right? Um, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. Um, but exploits isn't in the Hebrew. Okay. So he's giving a list of the exploits. But why would why would he want to make this and make the statement was the expedition against Judea and the capture and destruction of Jerusalem? Because that's one of the exploits. He, he's just going to say that these are going to be the things that Rome are going to do. Okay. Right. Because he's going to have in the next verse at the time appointed. Well, that's going to be. 3.30, right? All right. So he's going to he's gonna deal with uh, 3.30 AD. So he's going from 3.31, the Battle of Actium, to 3.30 AD, the setting up of Constantinople. Right? Not 3.31, so, from 31. 31 BC. Right. What did I say? 3.31. Oh, yeah, that's just because I was stuttering. <laughs> but yeah, so 330 and 31 BC. So that's the 360 years, right? And, okay. and so, so then he's going to put these o exploits into the that period of time. But that doesn't really make much sense because he shall do and return to his own land. Well, he's going to try to, you know, put all of that in that whole period of time, because at the time appointed, which is the next verse, and we're going to deal with that, you know, in more detail, because there's a lot we have to go over again, review about uh, verse 29. But that's what he's doing with verse 28, is he's just taking the word exploits, which isn't in the Hebrew, and then giving a list of those exploits, okay. which, which includes the destruction of Jerusalem. So if you go on and read what he says here. Right, part, he's of, part of what I understand Smith is doing as well is he was uh, considered the, one of the, the leading. Uh, Ellen and James White counted on him to be the historian to record things. There's one quote I found of his uh, asking why they, why the Whites didn't ask other Preachers to go along with them on their trips, and they were always asking him. This is a quote. Why do they always ask me? Pretty neat quote. But I think that's what he's doing there by listing all those exploits. He's just recording the history, not mm -hmm. for any particular reason in the scripture. No, no, no. no, no. Some, that's, some, that's not what he's no. doing, Kevin. No, you're wrong. No, that's not. Well, he's well, not just. Well, I'm just history. trying to answer Dwight's question. Like, yeah, yes, but I don't think that's correct. I don't think that's the right answer, though. I'm sorry about that. Okay. But he he's don't actually be sorry. I'm just because, throwing it out there. It, yeah, because if you look at what he's doing here, he's dealing with the the 360 years, right? So it goes all the way back to verse uh, 24, where he talks about he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. That's a period of 360 years. So he's going to then address the Battle of Actium, right? Because that's what the verse is going to address. And then he's going to bring us all the way up to 330, right? So he has to, so he's taking the word exploits and then ex saying what those are, all of the things that Rome is going to do. Um, mm -hmm. So when he gets him to returning to his own land, it's not going to be Augustus returning to his own land. It's going to be, um, well, you'll see here later what how he looks at this. But but he's going to bring us all the way up to, um, you know, Constantine, basically. 
Right. But I guess what I'm saying is that all of these uh, historical records that he's mentioning or listing, they're not specifically mentioned in Scripture. Yeah, he's they are. Bringing out how they are happened. specifically mentioned in Scripture. Okay, That's well, I haven't well, been in class for a while. <laughs> yeah. I mean, definitely the destruction of Jerusalem is specifically mentioned in Scripture. Yeah, yeah. Right, and that's what he's addressing. Yeah, Yeah, so that's definitely... And he's not wrong in in listing this here uh, because we've already addressed Mm -hmm. it, right? It's just that... So there's not not anything wrong with what he's doing except that he's, um, he's trying to bring us to 330 He's, he's not he's not bringing us in the direct the, the right path to get there but anyway okay okay thanks okay yeah so dwight can you finish reading this part well we are now within a couple of minutes of our end of the time today so yeah sure. well yeah we're in within a couple of minutes but he, he's going to address okay uh, the siege of jerusalem so just read read these last. Um, Under Vespasian, the Romans invaded Judea and took the cities of Galilee, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, where Christ had been rejected. They destroyed the inhabitants and left nothing but ruin and desolation. Titus besieged Jerusalem. He drew a trench around it according to the prediction of the Savior. A terrible famine ensued the equal of which the world has perhaps at no other time witnessed. Moses had predicted that in the terrible calamities to come upon the Jews, if they departed from God, even the tender and delicate woman should eat her own children in the straightness of the siege, wherewith their enemies should distress them. Under the siege of Jerusalem by Titus, a literal fulfillment of this prediction occurred, and he hearing of the inhuman deed, but forgetting that he was the one who was driving them to such direful extremities, swore the eternal extirpation of the accursed city and the people. Keep going. Jerusalem fell in AD 70. As an honor to himself, the Roman commander had determined to save the temple, but the Lord had said there should not remain one stone upon another, which should not be thrown down. A Roman soldier seized a brand of fire and climbing upon the shoulders of his comrades, thrust it into one of the windows of the beautiful structure. It was soon in the arms of the devouring element. The frantic efforts of the Jews to extinguish the flames were seconded by Titus himself, all but in vain. Seeing that the temple must perish, Titus rushed in and bore away the golden candlestick the table of showbread, and the volume of the law, wrapped in golden tissue. The candlestick afterwards deposited in Vespasian's temple to peace and copied on the triumphal arc of, arch of Titus, where its mutilated image is yet to be seen. So here we have these points that the menorah, the candlestick, the golden candlestick, the seven-branched candlestick, are yet found on the Arch of Titus and would have been in a pagan temple. So we have several things yet to address that we will return to in the morning. Are there any other comments or questions today? Uh, Just stop sharing. I'm just going to show the picture of the Arch of Titus. Okay. Um, and it is so you can see there the candlestick has seven branches right and so this is this so they actually had the the branch candlestick and so they they copied what it looks like so anyway that answers that question about how many branches it had okay thanks Dwight okay any other comments at this point Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you that when you provide a warning, that you fulfill your word. 
that you help us to see that you are always direct, that you do not give a warning capriciously, that these are here for our admonition. Help us this day, direct us in all that you would have us to do. Bless our efforts as we look to you to be guided. We thank you for this time of study. We pray that you will be able to bring us back again together tomorrow. For this, we thank you, and for this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.